Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very special bonus filmed, though we're not looking at the cameras, oh. dispatch of the Reason Roundtable podcast. What? Mm. If I'm, if you're, you're going to instruct meta me right off the top, oh, I'm not going to look at that camera. Lighten I'm not going to look Francis. at that camera at all. Um, no, uh, we're doing this uh, special for our webathon, the annual webathon that uh, Reason does, and this is going to be a great uh, podcast. Not because of us, although maybe um, at least because of Catherine, but uh, because we are going to be responding to the marvelous, absolutely stunningly great um, uh, emails and texts and and tweets and. SMSs that you sent us. What? Um, Go ahead and say no, TikTok. Not a lot. Okay. Okay. That's how yeah. people send texts, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Corn Pop uh, sent a whole stream of uh, <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Can, over I, and over can I get an info in advance about how many Corn Pop references no, we're it. in I'm for out. in the next calendar year? I'm done. Uh, I uh, uh, we're doing this live uh, in person, so the non-aggression principle will be tested mm. uh, over the next uh, hour, or however long we're uh, out here uh, talking to uh, you all. But we're in the Reason uh, DC office at a ping pong table, um, uh, happily giving this to you. Is there an annual webathon we've been doing it for about ten years? Ten years, uh, which is great. Uh, it's, it was a, a humble little uh, starter kit webathon way back in the day, uh, and uh, now it's it's going strong. Catherine, why don't you give us the this Giving Tuesday right now that we're uh, taping this in? I don't know when we're going to release it. Uh, why don't you give an overview of why uh, the kids out there who listen to this and our other podcasts should consider giving a tax deductible donation to the Reason Foundation, which publishes and prints or does whatever to this podcast it prints this podcast yeah, yeah mm. that's why people on should give it, us on money. sms it costs a lot of money for all the paper we have to print the podcast on um no people should give us money because they enjoy the stuff we produce that's the that's the real answer and uh if you're listening you are probably one of those people who enjoys the stuff we produce but uh the slightly longer answer i would say is that reason has for 50 years stuck up for weird stuff that no one else will stick up for and i think uh that's easy to forget um things like <laughs> marijuana legalization things like gay marriage uh are robot are, brothels uh, yeah, yeah well so these are things that uh, all together yeah mm -hmm. uh, ideally in a single venue uh these are things that uh seemed totally crazy um bordering on actually uh you know impossible when we started uh advocating for them and are now in many cases reality uh so i think that's that's the biggest case for giving to reason also definitely the tax deduction also the swag and i think people should appreciate mm -hmm. the good swag if you donate to the webathon you get um different swag at different levels but uh this year's special bonus item is a is a little cover for your computer camera which feels really mm -hmm. on brand like very on brand for us uh so if you are worried that the man is watching you secretly through your camera you just cover that little guy up uh point of point of order question could could you put it on for me because i'm not sure yeah, yeah matt will need tech support to literally use adhesive on his camera yeah um the you can also get um free subscriptions you get a t-shirt which is special to the webathon and you can only get for webathon uh robbie suave's excellent book and then once you start giving us real cash monies like a thousand bucks or so um you get invitations to special reason events including uh, at the highest level our uh, conference in guatemala in february wow all right uh nick before we get started answering questions mostly about your jacket um or jackets if, as the case may be we don't, we'll find out later uh, spoiler alert. Uh, what's what's a good uh, reason for the season for giving? Uh, I am uh, going to pitch uh, Reason TV, the uh, video platform uh, dreamed up by Drew Carey and uh, and launched in October of two thousand seven. Thanks uh, to Nick Gillespie, among other people. No, no. I, I mean, I edit. I was the editor in chief for I don't know, like ten years, eleven years. But it's now under the capable hands of Meredith Bragg, uh, who is a phenomenal uh, talent and is looking on off camera so you know yeah. What, yeah. what are you gonna say right you know Wait, he's, he's got the are gun. we supposed to acknowledge him we i no, we're so not we but he's got two of my wall, children right? uh, you know he's exist. you know he's holding a gun to their head so you know i gotta give something but last year just last year alone reason tv generated a record high 29.5 million views on youtube Jesus. alone which worked out to uh, the way youtube does it 2.7 million hours of quality wow. viewing material reason videos and you know this didn't exist <clears throat> a dozen years ago uh, but it's it, it's amazing 
And the video stuff, which is, is I think is particularly worth, I, well, I don't want to say it's particularly worth supporting, but what's great about video, and this was what Drew talked about when he first came to David Knott, president of Reason Foundation, and myself, he said, you know, Reason has done a really good job of, in terms of printed online stuff of, you know, making the case, you know, for this policy or that policy, this mindset or that mindset, exposing various, you know, ridiculous things and everything. Video allows you to reach a whole different type of audience or to supplement the audience. You have to win hearts as much as as much as minds uh, and things like that. And we've really, um, you know, I think Reason TV has delivered on that in, in a big way. And it's a growing way. It's also a great way to reach young people about uh, it's like 56 percent of our audience is under 35 online. And it's expensive. It is expensive. Well, it takes money and it's it's hard to do. And this is one of the things that I think the wizards, uh, you know, the warlocks and witches at Reason TV, what they do is they make the videos look simple, or easy, like you take them for granted that they're actually interesting, that they're well done. When you go to almost any other magazine site, um, you realize that Reason is doing something differently. It is expensive. It's absolutely worth supporting. Uh, and I'll just point it uh, uh, on a final note. Last year, our main, our biggest hit that was released last year was this great piece by uh, Justin Monticello called The Insane Battle to Sabotage a New Apartment Building Explains San Francisco's house, Housing Crisis. It's got 900,000 views on YouTube alone, many more on Facebook. For a video about housing policy. Yeah, no, and it, it shows yeah. this. Nothing, nothing if not sex. It shows this guy uh, who owned a laundromat in, uh, I guess, the Tenderloin or on the edge of the Tenderloin in, in San Francisco. <clears throat> and he wanted to build an apartment building, you know, in, a, in a, a city that is like the most expensive place to live that doesn't have any apartment buildings. And it took him over five years and about one and a half million dollars to go through the permitting process. He finally ended up winning. Um, and getting the okay to do what would be good for him and everybody who is even going to keep the laundromat going. So it's like um, this is the type of you you have to see it to fully appreciate how absolutely screwed up certain types of policies are. And video is a great way to do that. So that's yeah. something to support the, uh, with a tax deductible donation. The pivot to video that a lot of organizations, journalism organizations did embarrassingly about four, three, four, five years ago yeah. with uh, under Facebook, which is gruesome. The results, uh, not just for their bottom lines. Well, but and the, uh, if I can go qualities. a little bit meta, I mean, I think what's great about Reason Video and uh, is that <clears throat> uh, Marsha McLuhan once said that every new media, uh, every new medium spends like 25 years replicating the thing that it just surpassed. Um, and you see that in a lot of online video, especially coming out of think tanks and, and uh, magazines and ideological movements where they just do crappy versions of talk shows. They just do bad versions of what's on uh, MSNBC or NBC News or whatever. And we actually brought a journalistic sensibility. We did documentaries, the interviews we did. And we started doing in-depth interviews at a time when everybody said, you know, the time span, uh, attention span online was 30 seconds or whatever. And we have some of our biggest hits that have gotten over mil a million views are hour long plus interviews with people. We were anticipating uh, the kind of podcast world we live in now where Joe Rogan can talk for three and a half or four hours, uh, where Dan Carlin at Hardcore History can do, you know, 15 hours on the uh, Japanese empire and people still want more. Um, so it's. The video that we're doing is infused, you know, it, it comes from reason and the DNA and reason, which is that alternative mindset, journalistic sensibilities, and then a sense for how do you deal with new media? How do, how do you deal with new forms and formats? So I'm a big fan. Suderman, you are a features editor. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Uh, well, I realize that I, I don't spend a lot of time on the Reason Roundtable uh, introducing us by our proper titles because it's uh, boring. Uh, but uh, Nick it's, and I, I consider it my yeah. improper title. Nick and yeah, I are both Matt editors at large. This will down actually, you know what? Private first class. This intern. is going to be one of our first questions, so I'll just stop mm -hmm. it there. But as features editor, what's your reason for the season? For the uh, yeah, so I mean, reason does so many things well. Um, Nick mentioned our journalistic uh, sensibility, and so I just want to talk a little bit specifically about our journalism, and in particular, our long form essays and investigation. Uh, I think uh, that we can make a credible case that we do long form essays and investigation better than any other magazine in our class and as well as any publication out there. And the reason is that we have is that we have money that comes from donors that allows us to pay people uh, and to pay people to spend time on projects that take a very long time. 
I am lucky enough to get to work with some really talented and excellent journalists here, Eric Bame, uh, Elizabeth Nolan Brown, CJ Ciaramella, um, Christian Britschke, on long form, heavily reported <laughs> pieces that take uh, that really take quite a lot of effort to produce. These things can take weeks, they can take months. And I want to zero in on a very specific thing that takes money to do, which is obtain documents from the government. And this is something that people don't think about very much, but we have to think about a lot because we spend an awful lot of time requesting and uh, documents from the government mm -hmm. and then going through them. And this is something that they charge you for. In some cases, they, they ask for really insane amounts of money. We had a request where we got back the price uh, we, we got back the price on some documents that we wanted, and it was twenty thousand um, dollars. And now that is not something that we actually pursued, but we but that's not uncommon to to just get really insane amount uh, prices for some of the documents that we want to look at. And so, without your contributions, without uh, your tax duct deductible donations, Reason can't can't get governments. Uh, can't get documents from the government and can't look at them and find out what the government is doing wrong and tell you about it. Uh, I would just mm -hmm. add uh, before we go to uh, all of your great questions and start the uh, uncomfortable answering process, uh, just that uh, this webathon and the nonprofit structure of reason is absolutely crucial to making us a stable organization. We're sitting right here around a ping pong table with the last 20 years worth of editors in chief. Um, and though we don't like each other, uh, it, there's, a, there's, <laughs> sure. a, there's a continuity of, of thought when you look at the magazine all the way back through its founding. Even Lanny Friedlander, uh, the founder, who is a, a different type of person for sure, but there is an absolute through line. Uh, Catherine made up uh, shirts uh, for, uh, the thing was just for uh, the recent weekend, right? The uh, With the... Um, um, uh, text from Lanny Friedlander's inaugural uh, editorial, which is great. You can go look at it uh, online. But there's a continuity at Reason, and that continuity is allowed because we have a nonprofit structure, but specifically because we have an audience. I mean, think about other opinion magazines in the world. Like, whatever, what the hell happened to the New Republic? You know, what happened to the Weekly Standard? It died. Uh, most of magazines of opinion, they depend foolishly, in my view, on the uh, kind of benevolence of either a rich person who doesn't mind losing money or a rich person who doesn't mind uh, funding a nonprofit that also loses money uh, over the years. That makes you incredibly unstable should the rich person catch a cold uh, or have some other uh, change of heart about the direction of the organization. We are uh, comparatively immune to such things in part because of this webathon. Um, every year we get somewhere between 600 and 1300 individual donations uh, uh, from you people listening. And that is an incredible kind of resilience that it bakes into our structure. Uh, so it doesn't matter the whims of a single person here. It matters that we have an audience. And, uh, and I've said this many times before, but it's worth uh, repeating. One of the greatest things about being an editor or an ex-editor is you meet people who encountered the magazine in 1973 and, mm. and they tell you about it like when they first saw it or when they followed this ad and went there. And there's even a couple of questions that kind of uh, talk uh, about that. Uh, that that is a wonderful thing. We the reason, uh, and you know, we're stewards as editors. Uh, hopefully, we're more active as well. But uh, at, that's a, a great honor to do that, and it's that intensity of that relationship which makes it possible. Reason existed as a as a uh, a side project, believe it or not, uh, run by three professionals who never paid anyone or paid themselves for the first fifteen years of its existence. It's amazing to me still to think about that, uh, and that uh, a reaction with the readers and relationship is is what allows it to be reason and not, um, you know, go off the handle and start uh, talking uh, monomaniacally about whatever weird uh, passion of the uh, founder of it. OK, let's go to questions. Now, can we talk about how much we dislike each other? No, that's a, that's the question. <laughs> Actually, number three. I, I have a no, that's I the do it subtext now. of every question. I uh, yeah. thinking, you would say that thinking about this question. I, I developed a Suderman approved uh, like way of thinking about it. I feel like we're just all the different Spider-Men in yeah, Into the Spider-Man. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Like. And so you Nick's guys, obviously it, the drunk one, drunk one. <laughs> no, no, Nick is the black well, and white. Come on. Noir, Nick you is the are noir drunker than I am. You're the oh, black yes. Spider-Man yeah. noir played by Nicolas Cage. Yeah. yeah. Voiced by Nicolas yeah, Cage, yeah. I should and, say. And, and only in black you know, uh, Does that recent, make me Spider-Pig? I don't I know. I refuse that, yeah. to be the one in the ballet shoes, so we're going to have to do some sorting. No, you're like the little Japanese robot girl. Oh, I am. Oh, my God. That's excellent. We've just lost her for the afternoon. I think I might be the kind of slightly fat Spider-Man prime who, like, 
like guides the heroes let's through put his it journey. Way, the doesn't three really of do us anything. are because he's doing the meta commentary Spider-Man. about the structure yeah. of being a Spider-Man. Right. He's he's just there to explain what it means anyway, to be Spider-Man rather than Bob so, po- Bob Pool is like OG Spider-Man. Like it really. So works, we guys. are. So we combine into this. And now a mix of what was the name of the Voltron. villain? You're thinking of Voltron? Is uh, yeah, what is Volt? No, who is the one from uh, the, the Power, Power Rangers? Rangers? Is that Voltron? Power Rangers is just a ripoff of Voltron. I yeah. believe so, that they okay. are a, a mega, a megazord. A megazord. Yeah. Megazoid? My, my son, yeah. my son will will someday listen to I, this uh, podcast and be proud. Of here, me. I'll, I'll, you know, it's coming up on the Christmas season. I remember one year my older son when he was a kid, we w- were running out of things to watch at the video store back when we had such things, and we got a Power Rangers Christmas. Christmas special that we hadn't heard before loaded up and it turned out to be the da- uh, data the robot who who is at the satellite circling earth leading a children's chorus singing christmas carols oh my god i'm getting that it was the saddest thing it's gotta be on I've youtube ever seen. Right? okay okay it was Spider-Man. like it was let's like sophie's some, choice but a tragedy let's take some questions for uh, God's let's sake. take uh, questions here uh, and we'll go we'll start kind of on a meta note uh, chris asks What's the difference between a features editor, an editor at large, and an editor in chief? Which one of you can fire the other three? And have you ever been tempted, Catherine? Do you <laughs> that is answer? that is so, Chris. Uh, 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 do you want to answer? Um, that question? Sure. Uh, I am the editor in chief, which means that I am the manager and mm-hmm. boss of all of these yeah. jokers. You on are the some captain level. Uh, and have I ever been tempted to fire? Yes, every single really? one of them. Okay. Every have you ever been? Uh, have you been tempted to self-deport? I yeah, no, okay. actually no. I've never really? been. I've been tempted yeah. to. I've been tempted to clear the decks and start over. Okay. But you know, mm-hmm. well, that's fair. Every uh, every once in a while, I, I'm like afraid that I'm going to look over your shoulder at your desk and see a draft email to me yeah. in, in yeah. your you know, in your email that's just you're fired. Sometimes when I need to talk to people in private, I now feel like I have to do that thing where. I'm I'm like, can we um, talk for a minute privately? It's not bad yeah. because it's like it's scary maybe to like have an. Un- yeah. When your boss says, hey, can we talk for a minute? People get nervous. Yeah. That's why I, I live in New York. And that's why capitalism is good. Cannot la- you know, it can't oh, no. survive. Sorry. Late capitalism. I've been hanging Late out capitalism. too long, right. too much so with the Jacobin people. The editors in uh, the editors at large are former editors in chief right. and kind of ministers without portfolio. Features editor writes uh, and edits features from the staff mostly that's fair enough uh chris also asked and gotta say these are great questions but a lot of you are like white house uh, press uh, reporters there You're like let me ask you the 13 part question mm-hmm. but some of these are short uh does nick have a closet full of black leather jackets or just the one he always wears uh i have several um and i wouldn't say closet full but i probably have about a half a dozen different jackets all leather or some uh, some are uh, you have that velvet one you wear i have i have a velvet one i have a microfiber suede one um i have a trench coat i have yeah so you have a favorite you know i don't want to say because they might be listening (laughs) <laughs> Adam asks what do Matt, Nick and Catherine do during Peter's what are you consuming reviews 100 push ups oh, yeah. catch up on some reading pen the next editorial cook dinner we need to know I'll say that I'll start uh, I delete emails um, mm. and uh, uh, quietly with my uh, hybrid keyboard set up here but I just recently uh, got myself a little like synthesizer which is right next to my keyboard so now I'm actually going to be like, pre- practicing the piano while uh, while Peter does this, Catherine, what do you, mm. you're in the room with him. That's got. I'm in the room with yeah. him. Uh, yeah, normally it's a very small, it's a very booth. small. So <laughs> yeah. he would. I mean, I just listen because I'm I'm trapped. Um, but I but I think should we tell people what we sometimes do when? Oh you no, you should tell people. When, oh no. So sometimes when people who are not in the DC podcast uh-uh. booth are going That's, on mm. a, a bit long, rather than long. let the rage build up in our hearts, mm. what Peter and I do is it's not rage. It's rage. Um, we do this. We just do a little like <laughs> Real. a little dance party. There together. is do there's spontaneous dance, dance oh. order in the Reason Podcast booth. And it helps us not be angry. This is yeah. you wow. know, weirdly now I feel rage. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but I mostly you're, you can dance with I can yourself. dance if I want to. In Look, I grew up in you the eighties. I know better than anyone that you behind. can dance if you want to. Um I uh mostly go to uh the Teletubbies. Uh, terroir, 
Oh, I the, think uh, a lot about the yeah the, <laughs> the black and white slow uh, like uh, one no they, no it's the happy one. it's a happy OG, one that OG, yeah where you television. yeah where you just kind of walk around the little hillock and then you know that when the toast starts coming and you know I'm just waiting for that siren to be called back into consciousness. I get it, guys. I'll try to make my recommendations shorter. Uh, I think I that, wouldn't. I wouldn't change a thing. No, I wouldn't change a thing. Uh, yeah. I think that Nick is the Tinky Winky of this uh, uh, podcast crew. I don't know uh, what that means. Um, Jeffrey asks, any live shows planned outside of Soho Forum debates, Catherine? Jeffrey asks, did I commit suicide? If so, <laughs> anything in the L.A. area? Uh, I don't think we have anything on the books in L.A. right now, but we do, of course, uh, as you say, have the Soho Fora, Soho Forums. 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 Well, the Soho Forum debates. They're debates. four eye. They're, they're, yeah. that's it's not a right. lot of four eyes, I'll um, tell you that. And, but no, uh, after, after my... Uh, victory slash success uh debating capitalism at iq squared i'm the done. victory slash what did victory you slash to? success did you like that for like, victory slash failure is what i meant okay. to say but actually yeah. all my failures are also successful no that's so. true you know if you're if you're or not failing if you're not failures. failing all the time are you're not successes. trying hard enough, something like that. Yeah, I think right? I do yeah. think if you don't sometimes miss a plane, you're getting to the airport too early, which is like a All corollary right. to that. Yeah, that was uh, Muhammad Adda who came up with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Jason asks policy question: What is the best case outcome for this impeachment mess? Uh, he says that he's hoping for a deal where Trump agrees to drop out of 2020 in exchange for a Senate censure. Uh, I'm afraid he says that a removal or an outright acquittal both have potential violent downsides etc and so on uh, for little l libertarians just having anything happen to reign in power of the presidency is a win even if it's just a slap on the wrist would like to know your opinions nick why don't you start i uh i think i'm alone among the uh, podcast people here that i don't really think that trump should be impeached over what we've heard about much less removed from office the one thing I'll say, I think it's it, it's hard to say, like, does it make the upcoming election season better or worse? I mean, it definitely pours gasoline on a fire, you know, it's thermonuclear, all of that. The one thing I'll caution against, because I, I know that uh, I, I think Catherine and Peter, at the very least, and maybe you, Matt, are of the mindset that we should impeach more presidents or impeach the president more often. All I know is that, you know, Nixon was about to get impeached, resigned, a real flex of constitutional power and of Congress's Congress's power. A weird flex. A strange say. flex, strange flex, but OK. Right. And then uh, Clinton was impeached. And you know what happens? Like the president just keeps getting more and more powerful in many, many ways. And I interviewed Judge Napolitano, the great libertarian Fox News personality. Uh, recently, and he was saying, you know, the problem is, is that when Republicans are in power, they give uh, the Congress gives power to Republican presidents and Democrats give it to Democrats, but they keep it and it just keeps building and building. And there's a lot of truth to that. The happy side of it is that I still I am the last holdout on the idea that we're still in the libertarian moment or it has not just actually happened. And I do feel in a way that one of the things that Trump is doing, and I think the impeachment proceedings will uh, kind of accelerate this is that at some point, all but the dumbest and most dead end political political people who insist on defining themselves first and foremost in their political identities are going to say, you know what, we got to get the fuck out of here. And like, can we get on with our lives? This is, uh, you know, and and I think the impeachment, I think the Trump presidency is bringing a lot of that up and it's churning. It's not settled yet. But I think the impeachment thing might be the thing that gets more people to acknowledge that they want to evacuate politics as a as an arena of meaning in their lives and they want to get on with loving and you know learning new things and starting new businesses and just building the communities they want to be in rather than trying to attack each other through politics uh before pointing to peter i just uh, would add that <clears throat> when after the nixon uh, impeachment which or whatever the yeah. uh, water resignation day, uh Along with things like the Church Commission and mm -hmm. everything like that, yeah. the presidency, I think, was shrunk down. I mean, Dick Cheney was was obsessed with how much the presidency had lost power and that the mm -hmm. uh, it was it didn't last. It, I uh, think it got, you know, I it got I, re goosed I, under, I think, uh, George W. Bush. Oh, I know. Under Reagan, and, Reagan, uh, Reagan, Obama. Brand, I, I would argue that it, it, it you know, uh, Ford was in a peculiar place and was also dealt a very weak hand um, uh, congressionally. Carter was something of a weak executive, but also did. 
did a bunch of stuff that was not great, you know. Uh, but then right, Reagan, but, but, but he, by he was Reagan, also still uh, giving away yeah. some power as well. Reagan, but during well, the late 70s and 1980s, there was some sense within Congress that it was a co equal yeah. branch that yeah. could and should check the presidency. Yeah. I, I agree, it started and then under it Reagan. Melted, but and then it, it was, melted the minute that they got a leader who could, you know, kind of smile with a twinkle and, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, but I, I mean, I actually agree with Welch here is, yeah. is that the, the real expansion of executive power started with George W. Bush and then continued under Obama. And if you go back to the 1970s, uh, you had the Congressional Budget and Impoundment Act, which created the Congressional Budget Drink. Office, Drink. Drink, Drink. which this, was designed yeah. to check the the administration and the executive branch. It was designed to create a, an alternative scoring mechanism so right. that the, the president uh, couldn't to basically just say, here's what bills cost, yeah. here's our rosy scenarios for everything, which the president always has. A, a, and we an, use the an, term rosy scenario because of Reagan's first budget director, yeah. uh, David Stockman. And, and it, create, so but it, it created it, competition yeah. within the uh, with, between the yeah. branches that is imperfect, um, that has not always worked out well or well for libertarians, but is better than the uh, than the prior alternative, um, which but was has the, now atrophied. Was, yeah, well, like in all, but this all is cases. where, you know, I mean, uh, again, my larger point was that the impeachment stuff might be a, a good outcome would be kind of a, a renewal of that sense of yeah. that politics isn't, you know, isn't the focus and the presidency isn't the focus in the federal government. Because one of the things that we talk about this a lot that has completely disappeared from just a few years ago is, you know, worry and anxiety over the debt and the inability of the government to bring outlays and revenues, even within a thousand, uh, you know, a trillion dollars of each other. And the hold reason the, we the know about, about the debt about and deficits is uh, because of Congressional Budget Office reports that tell us <laughs> all the time. Um, I would just like, say, it's, so, it's, yes. it's, good, it's a good thing no, we're not sorry. actually playing the drinking game yeah. because we would be yeah. on the floor. Uh, I mean, I, I actually think a good upshot. I mean, I, I am not currently worried about violence or anything along yeah, those man. lines. I've been thinking a lot People about um, in terms you of know, how to evaluate. You know, we're only like 30 minutes into this. So. Uh, <laughs> oh, you were yeah, talking about the country. About the country. Okay. Um, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about the Trump presidency in terms of what's reversible and what's not reversible. Like what will what could um, go back to the pre-Trump status quo? What should, what shouldn't? Um, and obviously an outbreak of violence in response to sort of political processes would be a, like an irreversible and pretty disastrous step. I don't necessarily mm. see that happening. One thing I do think about impeachment, though, that could be good is if presidents lose the sense that they can get away with having private conversations that no one will ever find out about. Mm. And that, you know, didn't happen under Nixon, though it should have given no. the tapes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but like. The idea that like someone is taking notes, someone is recording this, you will be accountable for everything you say as president is that that should be a learnable lesson and it would yeah. be a good one. Is Can I ask, I mean, that that falls into the larger rubric of a kind of forced transparency that has been really part of political discussion, certainly since Nixon, but also, I mean, more so in the 21st century and with the, the rise of WikiLeaks and, you know, Chelsea Manning and a variety of other people like where it's really hard for governments, it's hard for corporations, it's hard for individuals uh, to keep secrets the way that they used to. Do you think that idea like that you can't have private conversations anymore, is that good or bad for government? Because you, you hear this a lot where it's like, well, now, you know, uh, people like Jonathan Rausch at Brookings, who writes for Reason, says, you know, you can't cut deals now because the deal making will come out and then people will lose their shit yeah. over it. I, I like nothing more than the like smoke and hot Rausch take yeah. uh, that actually a little bit of like backroom dealing is good for politics. Right. I think he probably actually is right about that. But the cost is too high to get that payoff. And I think mm. there's it's generally a good thing to just push as hard as we can in the direction of transparency yeah. for public officials. Uh, I think that's a different question um, than, you know, the, the transparency and privacy issues for private individuals, though those lines are, of course, blurry. But you know what one way would be to help uh, improve your chances of having privacy? You could donate $50 to yeah. the Reason nice. Webathon and yeah. get a little cover for you. I have it right here. I'm like sliding that? it back and forth. There? I'm sliding it back and forth right Reminding now. Reminding people of stuff. Okay, let's get to other questions. Uh, By the we, way, we this the Reason Webcam cover is not, uh, I think it was made in China. Right. So I hope so. I, I mean, it's try, a plastic if, piece if of at plastic. At all possible, but, we we try to yeah. you know order order our swag from okay. overseas, ideally yeah. made by. I just don't want it to have a back door. Illegal immigrants. Yeah. 
you okay. know, that's our deal. Uh, this, these plastic things were carried from China to the West Coast on sea turtles exclusively yeah. to get around tariffs? I was uh, forgot to mention at, at the top <laughs> that we're not going to be able to answer all the questions because there's so many good ones, but also because uh, Nick and Peter were just not going to shut up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Peter didn't we're, do yeah. it this time. No, but it's going to happen. We're the, we're the problem. <laughs> that's preemptive. Yeah, I'm we're, he's only mentioned the budget act like twice. <laughs> Okay. Because uh, you know, because I'm we're just, on camera now, not really. We're trying to enjoy ourselves you before you start face. talking about Gene Mock and the Angels. Okay, Gene okay. Autry too. Uh, Joseph asks, uh, and the wording here is important. What's your favorite book you recommend others read? I'm going to start because you mentioned Jonathan Rauch. My favorite book to recommend. It's not necessarily my favorite book, although I love it. Uh, is Kindly Inquisitors by Jonathan Rauch. Uh, it is. Uh, it is more than any other book that I've recommended to people has reordered and rethought the way that they think about the question of free speech and free inquiry and the importance of defending it uh, against all kinds of uh, different threats. It's just a wonderful book. Catherine? Uh, I don't know. This is actually kind of hard for me to do on the spot. But, um, you know, I'm going to go with our last year's uh, podcast fallback, which is like anything by neil stevenson i'm just gonna do it and <sighs> screw y'all because wow. the fact is if you and especially honestly snow crash like just to go yeah. old school like if you want to think about a world that looks uh like the future libertarians want and also isn't like foolishly rosy like look at that thing and it's a it's a dystopia but so's the present it's like a topia, really, right? It's a, and and it's it is a it, topia. I think we've discussed this. I I think it is works. almost a description of the world we live in. You know, I mean, there's bells and whistles, but it's, yeah. you know, where there's a lot of freedom and a lot of autonomy and a lot of repression and suppression and a lot of problems. But it's you know this thick web of, a lot of overlapping. Fake news. Yeah, no, I mean, I I think Snow Crash is yeah. an so, essential guide. Not to, to be the like moment. that guy, but. Snow Crash. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I was also thinking Snow you, Crash. You're also that guy. Because of I am yeah. not allowed, because she, Catherine has already mentioned it, I'll just say that uh, A Fire Upon the Deep by Werner Vinge, mm -hmm. um, which is a great book with uh, another great uh, sort of libertarian tinged science fiction book that is about spinning up a low tech society into a high tech society uh, very rapidly and all of the challenges that are involved and the ways uh, that authoritarian and centralized governments or government type uh, control systems make that both harder and are much worse for the populace uh, sort of degrade their lives and their well-being. Nick, book? I'm sorry, I was thinking about the uh, Teletubbies. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, we did an interview with uh, Vinji, or Mike yeah, Godwin fantastic. did about 10, 15 years ago. That's great. He's the guy who created the concept or first articulated the concept of the singularity yeah. really interesting uh science fiction writer um i am going to uh, go with uh, joseph schumpeter's capitalism socialism and democracy because uh, that's the book where he coined the term creative destruction and it is this kind of loving critique of marx's critique of capitalism uh and he too like marx says that capitalism is doomed to destroy itself but not marx said it was because ca you know in capitalism the all of the uh all of the wealth and all of the prosperity, all of the good stuff it goes to the capitalists, the one percent, essentially, and eventually the lumpen proletariat or the masses who have been gulled into conformity, both by threats of violence, as well as all kinds of cultural apparatus that normalizes exploitation. They finally shake off their, you know, their, their class consciousness or raise their class consciousness and start a revolution and everything is good. Uh, Schumpeter says that capitalism is mostly a victim of its own success and it throws off so much wealth that very rapidly people forget how tenuous wealth innovation progress is and they create a superstructure of intellectuals and of all other sorts of uh, kind of self-hating wealthy people who then gum up the works and destroy when faced with creative destruction and massive rapid dislocation of, of particular populations, nobody can take that anymore and they get rid of capitalism. And you can take or leave a lot of that. Schumpeter, though, I think he 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 was writing during World War II. He was a guy who was raised during the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and uh, fled Europe during World War One. Uh, like basically, if you there's a great biography of him called Prophet of Innovation, but everywhere he lived, like within five years, it didn't exist anymore. Like his hometown, the district that he grew up in was just vaporized. It didn't exist anymore. You know, World War One, uh, World War Two, the Depression, all of this stuff. 
his timeline was wrong, but I think we may be living in a Schumpeterian inflection point. And this, I'm a big fan, we were talking science fiction, I'm a big fan of Man in the High Castle by Philip K. Dick, and especially the Amazon thing, which is all about imagining alternative timelines. And I think it's a good time to be studying Schumpeter and figuring out how we, you know, how we go to an alternate reality and kind of bring something back that changes where we're heading. I the also, Schumpeter Stevenson present that we live in. Yeah. Uh, so I was going to say, though, that I also we recently on Slack discovered that, like, the reason Youngs had not read Harrison Bergeron. Uh, oh, really? And like, no. yeah, 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 I had like right, a little yeah. moment where I was like, "Everybody, cease your work and go read Harrison Bergeron because yeah, we by need Kurt that by Kurt Vonnegut yeah. because we need that story to function here at Reason." Uh, mm. So, if you want a uh, a good short recommendation for the middle of your workday, it's seven pages. It's on the internet. Let's go to some individualized questions here in our Reason Webathon bonus podcast of the reason roundtable should we be giving and if so where should we be giving that oh. uh, go to reason.com backslash webathon right no nope. yeah. donate no oh, donate <laughs> reason.com slash donate this is what happens also we don't it... have to say backslash anymore uh, slash for, it's just what, slash. did anybody use forward slash There's what a, was forward slash an uncomfortable slash. number of questions having to do with my ability to to navigate technology. I don't know why that oh, is. Yeah. So just uh, since there are cameras here, but not really here, yeah. everyone take a look at Matt's you're keyboard like Johnny, situation. You're like Johnny Unitas, <laughs> Matt. You know, okay. short back and sides. James and, uh, asks, high, high I'm top, curious about cleats. Peter's political ideology. He seems much more interested in politicians being respectable and government being efficiently run than in reducing the size of or entirely eliminating the state. Would he consider himself more of a centrist than a libertarian? And if so, how well does he fit in among the staff of an ostensibly libertarian mm. organization? Mm. Ostensibly is doing dude? a lot of work there, uh, Do chairs ever yeah. get thrown only at you, James? Go ahead, Peter. Uh, no, I don't consider myself a centrist. A uh, libertarian is by far the best political ideology terminology to describe <laughs> the me. body language. Um, yeah. You might, uh, right? Like, so I might also sense. describe myself as a... As an individualist or an anti-authoritarian, but if we're talking yeah. political types, um, libertarian is the right way, the, by far the best way to describe me. And so I, I, I occasionally get this question, why are you so concerned with sort of, uh, with, you know, comedy, uh, with sort of people, uh, with working within the system? And the reason is that I believe that the best way to make meaningful, sustainable gains for liberty is to take an outsider's view of American government but then to work from within inside it and to understand the system that you are trying to change. And I think that the most durable victories for liberty, especially at the federal level over the last 40 years or so, and I would say things like criminal justice reform, welfare reform, um, but also uh, this, these are not at the federal level, but they've happened on a nationwide basis, uh, gay marriage um, and, uh, and uh, pot legalization. All of these have happened because people, people were critics of the system, but they also decided Here's how this I'm going to go and work within that system. Mm. I'm going to work over time. I'm not going to going to uh, just sort of go in and throw bombs and say the system is bad. Let's blow it all up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say this will be better for you, person who doesn't agree with me, based on your values and based on the kind of life that you want to live. And so they made practical arguments rather than ideological arguments and they won and it took time. But they won durable victories that I think are going to be around uh, uh, for a long time. And then, you know, sort of it, this question comes up a little bit more in the Trump era. And so I'll just ad address it specifically to Donald Trump and to the presidency. The presidency has a, the president has an additional job uh, beyond making policy and beyond sort of deciding what it is that uh, that the executive branch is going to do, which is the, that the president models the character of both the government as an organization and to some extent the nation. And we, we might not like that as libertarians. We might not think that's a good thing, but it just is. And a president who, uh, who, who models character badly um, and who makes decisions badly uh, and is erratic um, is just is somebody who is going to be bad for politics and bad to work with if you are someone who is trying to make productive policy gains for liberty. And so that's why I care about those things, because I think that, that libertarian policy victories are important goods for 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 the nation and for the, the for the country and for the individuals who live here. Um, and I think it's 
uh, that that bad behavior, that erratic behavior, that the kind of behavior we often see from Donald Trump and people in his orbit in his orbit is um, makes that much harder. So can I uh, yeah. add to that? That, that I, that's a great uh, articulation in defense of your sensibilities, much of which I agree with. And it reminded me of the second book that I would have uh, suggested was Albert Hirschman's Exit Voice and Loyalty. And you, you are saying you're more of a voice man than an exit man or a loyalty man in that. You know, that you work within the system well, I mean, and reform it. I, I believe you know, that the right of exit is important. Yeah, um, well, that's you know, always, you, right? you need like, to have like that. that. As, yeah. as an individual, like that's sort of a, a, a primary yeah. um, thing that, that, I, that I like to see within systems. But uh, again, like it or not, uh, in many cases, yeah. we don't like it. The government is not something we are exiting from right. in the very near future if you live in the United States. And even if you move somewhere, you're probably moving to another place with right. a different government. And uh, uh, probably. What, one of the Maybe. things, yeah, probably. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> not you, Catherine. We, we, uh, we know no, where you're But what I was going to say planet. is, you know, one, one bone of contention there, I would say, and I realize this, again, I, I don't think this is a uh, popular point of view among libertarians in general or people on this podcast, but I would argue, and, and this is not a small point, and it's not a rhetorical point. One of the values of the Trump presidency, besides certain policies that are actually going to place, and he's done a lot of dumb things, but he's also, you know, when you talk about criminal justice reform, tax reform, a variety of programs that that he signed on to, I think he's actually revealing the way power operates. So when you talk about being erratic or, or you know, uh, side deals, all of this kind of stuff, you know, I don't think he is a break with Obama or with Bush, just to keep it in the 21st century. I think what he has done is he's so bad and clumsy at what he's doing. He's showing things. You know, Obama, the reason we're in Syria is because Obama improv improvised a line, a red line in the sand in Syria. That's why we're there. You know, that's erratic. That's dumb. It's unthought through. Um, he did not seek consensus. He passed probably the single biggest piece of legislation in our lifetimes by a straight party vote that he had to go to the mat to like, you know, give everything to who like Ben Nelson or, or some, you know, like a senator who was who was vanquished in the next election. I wrote many, yeah. many blog posts no, and, and about then, the passage of and the Affordable then Care Act. On, a, on another like profound like level, he was he was a total fraud where he was, you know, when Edward Snowden came out, he was like, oh, yeah, you know, I would welcome the opportunity to have a, a discussion about you know state surveillance that I've been doing and blowing the doors out on, um, and so in that sense I think we should relax a little bit about Trump and the you know the so-called you know oh he's destroying norms and mores and all of his enemies. There was just something in the New York Times about how like you know when Trump gets defeated he won't leave and he's an authoritarian. So we really kind of have to take him out now. Like there's this weird projection that Trump is going to be violent. Trump isn't going to do what he's told, even though he's backed down every time that he's actually been forced to. I mean, we're lucky he's, he's he's far too lazy uh, and yeah. inept. But to... all I'm saying is that I think I think it's powerful from a libertarian perspective to look at the continuity of Trump with past presidents rather than him as a as a break. Let's go to other questions Yay. rather than relive our weekly podcast the day after. Uh, Catherine, you've hinted that this is from Adam. You've hinted that when it comes to housing, you much prefer renting to owning. Can you elaborate? Yes, I would love to elaborate. I could elaborate at near Sudermanian lengths, but I will not. Um, I I believe in I believe in Do you renting. Think not Pick up long? trucks, rubber ducks, and renting. I believe in renting, and here's why: because. Um, Owning stuff is uh, is a burden uh, on almost every level. Uh, we are super lucky to live in the post ownership world, and we should embrace that. Uh, that means I don't own a car; I take Ubers. It means I don't own a house; mm. I rent. It means I don't barely own clothes; I have them come in a box and then I send them away. It's awesome. I don't own books; I just like download mm. them and then send them back into the cloud. This is a form of freedom. I get that it's not everyone's form and that's fine like there's the jerry two chilies of this world who are like unless i can build my own solar plant and mm. like water treatment system and whatever i'm not truly free i love that vibe i love that aesthetic it is not for me i want to be not dependent on anyone's system by being able to hop between competitors so don't buy 
because also there's political risk. That's my other case against buying. Uh, if you have kids, mm. you're taking the political risk of school redistricting, which is a very serious one, as Matt Welsh can tell us from his writing about Brooklyn's public school kerfuffles. If you uh, own a house, you are taking the risk of zoning, historical uh, protectionism, mm -hmm. whatever it's called, preservationism. Uh, you, by not owning a house, you protect yourself from the whims of politicians. Uh, yes, I'm a committed a renter to even in the face of Peter Suderman, probably the last time that I got stoned and it's because of you that I will never, ever do it again. <laughs> well, you bought a house when you were stoned. No, but I listened to this a hole <laughs> yeah. spend. So I will say Peter's, uh, basement bar is almost done and the joy on his face every day mm, when he great. walks into the office. I'm happy for his joy, but he wasn't happy for my joy. It was talking not just that I needed a 30-year mortgage, but I needed a 15-year mortgage. It was terrifying. Anyways. I'm um, also happy for my joy. Uh, my I, basement bar related joy. Uh, I'm a committed a renter uh, and, and largely because uh, I like to live in, in uh, cities close to things. Um, those and renting is the only way I could afford and I can't really afford it, but, uh, uh, to live in said cities. And also those cities are always run by ignoramuses who don't respect private property rights. And if I owned something and then they kept charging me money for owning it, just the blood pressure and just telling me already. what I can't, Your face I can't is literally chickens, turning red at this idea. Like, no, I would turn into that guy and I don't want to be that guy, but also don't raise chickens, but I wouldn't raise chickens. Uh, wolf, rent. wolf raise. I rent the chickens. Yeah. Um, let's go to a, uh, one directed at Nick from Spencer. Uh, why does Nick hate public libraries and what? does he actually have evidence to support his hate? And two, is there a libertarian defense of public libraries as civic institutions? Spencer. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that Spencer may have taken a joke literally, uh, when, right. which was Seriously? that the whole thing about but the drag queen literally? story hour mm. that oh, started a whole a big this kerfuffle. A drag queen story hour and I said, you know, the problem for me isn't the drag queens, it's the public library oh, that, that took place at. I was um, I, um, you know, I, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about public libraries. I do remember my growing up that my hometown of Middletown, New Jersey, had a great library that I spent a lot of time in and ended up working in, uh, which is one of the reasons why I'm against municipal workforces. I know what goes on. Um, but more to the point, public library is not a big problem for me. Most of what they do would be provided by private services, nonprofit services. There is a public good. And, you know, people like Benjamin Franklin created one of the first public lending libraries. Uh, it was a subscription library that also let people who couldn't afford things borrow stuff. It's a good model. Private I libraries are great. That's, I mean, Blockbuster Video was a private library yeah. of, uh, that was a nationwide sort of uh, replicated of the, yeah. private library so, that you had to pay to get stuff from. And it, it and gave me pay. a cinematic education. Yeah. Also, you, if you're me and you've literally never returned a library book on time in your life, you have to pay for those two. Yeah. It's weird um, tick. One yeah, of the, can't do one it. Of, I was raised badly. One of the, uh, I, as I've gotten older, the bus as I've gotten older and, and more comfortable gonna, economically, of course, my class analysis comes out more and more. And one of the things about things like public libraries um, and uh, museums and parks is that overwhelmingly every every survey that looks at this shows that they are mostly patronized by people who are middle class, upper middle class or rich. And I know where I lived in Oxford, Ohio, one of the things that used to drive me ballistic were uh, people who were like, oh, let's charge, let's raise the library tax so we can have a new building and more DVDs. And you would see people who were in the upper 20 percent of income distribution in America going to the fucking library to get the new DVD rather than just going to you know, the uh, uh, blockbuster or movie gallery or whatever. And Network it's like video. Yeah. In it, Niceville, uh, Florida. it just, you know, that that bugs me like people who are frugal on the public tit. That really bugs the shit out of me. And I wrap that into a critique of libraries. Uh, question for me from Joe. Um, or sort of for me. Uh, isn't it true that Matt Welch only uses amazing metaphors because KMW really loves them in all their mixed glory in her chilled, dark heart of darkness? Is, is there a mixed metaphor in there? Because I, I don't. I there? know you can't mm. tell. No. Um, the answer is definitely no. That is <laughs> that 
that is an absolutely organic Matt Welsh phenomenon, which he he had just been, as far as I can tell, publishing these mixed yeah. metaphors in the world. Life. When did yeah, when life. did that start? I mean, I, I think maybe didn't always change. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's so. just like then when I was working for you and I was sitting across from you every day, and you would send me copy, and it would just be like, what is this? I mean, I worked for primarily like the first twelve plus years of my life uh, in journalism at a college newspaper at a newspaper I started and then at a newspaper that I was the managing editor of. Mm. So I've been in charge of my own words oh my the entire time. So there hasn't been until people... you hired me. <laughs> I like mixed metaphors. I, don't I like even... mixing. Mon uh, let's call them sure. mongrel metaphors. Matt. I, I like mixing alcohol. Yeah. Uh, let's go to a question about Justin Amash because it feels like we have to have one. Yeah. Uh, if when Justin Amash announces his run for president as a libertarian, how would you advise him first mistake uh, to position himself uh, for the general election against Trump and the Democrat? What would you consider his metrics for a successful run? Nick, you're an informal advisor to Justin Amash. How would you advise? him? I am run? not an informal advisor yeah. to Justin Amash, but I would lose the name Justin. Yeah, I'm ba I'm really against. Pierre? No, I'm against like ethnic sounding names with like super wasp for an I like I, I just can't take that. You, so, so you that need would to double up. Or I think he go... needs to go with Biff, Biff Amash, <laughs> something like Skip. that. Skip would be good. Yeah. Uh, no, I um, I would be excited to see Amash run for president because I think that he represents a new generation of politician in many ways, including ethnically or, or demographically, certainly in terms of ideas. He has a lot of energy. And I think he's got a great American narrative story to tell, which is counters uh, people like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, and, and a younger generation, which sees an ethnic America or like a post-white America as a place of horrible and ongoing uh, oppression, repression, suppression of, you know, capitalist greed and, you know, just dispossession of people. And I think Amash's story, plus his interest in institutions and history and thought and his experience is 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 the exact counter to that kind of stuff. I would love to see him run as president for president because he would have that stage. I don't know if he will or not. I, I you you have more insight into that than I I would do. bet no at the current yeah. moment, but I've I I've think he I think he you know, no every age past. has like, you know, four or five or six or whatever how a representative types. And I think Justin Amash is one of those people. I think AOC is. I think there's a couple of other people out there. And uh, his voice, I would like, I would like it to have a bigger and bigger stage. I can uh, comment on his own sense of metrics of uh, of uh, for a successful run, which is on first order of business is that you run to win, uh, which he has done successfully on a lot of different levels. And it would be a new thing for him to imagine mm. running to not win. Uh, and so that would be kind of difficult to wrap mm. his brain around. I think that he probably wouldn't consider doing it unless he could imagine getting 20 percent of the vote uh and i can't imagine the libertarian party under anyone uh this time around getting uh even five percent of the vote uh, really even if it was just an homage that might change that, that I, might change uh things but the the structural position that the uh any third party is in in 2020 presidential race is just historically abysmal i mean every every single uh, every single third party uh vote spike is followed by a quick uh, and speedy decline, particularly mm. when the previous election was uh, very close between the two majors and, uh, and and very contested and emotional. So people flee from third parties and independents in that uh, condition. And uh, all of the signs of turnout in the 2018 midterms and all the special elections. I mean, we're breaking records for turnout in every single election in the amount of yeah. interest that people are paying already in the 20. 20 nominating process, uh, not in the Republican Party, but in the Democratic Party, uh, it just everything speaks to people are flooding towards a major party you're either with or against. And you got to get on, on board. That's a really tough place. You got to get on that no malarkey tour bus. No malarkey. Um, yeah. But yeah. I mean, I do think if we're going to if we're staring down the barrel of, say, a Warren Trump <laughs> election, I would really, really like to see a Justin Amash on the ticket. I think there are a lot of people, unlike me, who want to vote, who feel mm. that it's important to vote. 
And I, you know, it puts those people in a real untenable position if they care at all about individual liberty, because neither of those candidates has a particularly strong record or recommendation about protecting those rights and liberties. And so just having a good third option would be Mm. good. Um, Brian asks a multifactorial. Is that uh, a Brian with a Y? No, just normal. Brian. Okay, because if it was with a Y, I think we should just go. No, to the I next put it at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, there's a question about that. Uh, what is the greatest tech advice each of you have received from Matt Welch? See what? <laughs> listen. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to ask that question because we were talking about the good sartorial advice that you give us. Though, can we talk about that? You can. Yeah. Okay, so Matt Welch famously has told both me and Peter in different forms that when you go out in public, you should dress like the character of yourself on television, which I think is a great, is a great piece of advice. You should, you should it's not applicable cosplay. to everyone. You should cosplay yourself basically. And I am here for it. Um, and I want to go ahead and apologize to those who are viewing this on video for my hair being normal human hair color. Um, that is the thing that's going to be happening going forward. So mm. my bad, but I, I'm trying to do like a Cruella de Vil meets Susan Sontag. Oh, uh, Tulsi Gabbard and is a little bringing Tulsi, it back. Bringing yeah. a little Tulsi. So let me know if it's working. Give me what, a uh, why did you, uh, why did you kibosh? You know why? Cause I, I didn't want to end up like you, Nick. I heard that. I heard that. I yeah. mean, you know, you're stuck yeah. with the leather no, jacket forever yeah, yeah. and you, you, you can never what? not wear the leather jacket. And yeah, I can, I, I can as a change whenever I want. With a I just signature don't want to. sartorial move. Yeah, I was like, okay. you know, it's, if I don't defect from the purple hair now, it's gonna I'm gonna have to do it till I die. Someone else had asked, and it's not in front of me, so sorry I can't uh, mention your name. Matt, but... your uh, character, your TV character, was Screech from Saved by the Bell. Wasn't it? <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you own anything that's not black, Nick. Uh, yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, I have colors? seen Nick wear khakis and a white polo shirt. You've seen a photo. Really? No, I saw this when? at. At your 50th oh, yeah, birthday yeah, yeah. party. That, that was white a pants. polo shirt. Yeah, white pants. I'm pretty sure it was yeah. polo. It was Maybe a it was white, a button. No, I think it was a button down shirt. But it yeah, was, I, it I dressed was all in Nick, white. Nick as a zero fell to Nick's Crowley. Yeah. And it was amazing. This yeah. uh, more from Brian here. And uh, obviously Peter and Catherine do not need to answer it. Who is the greatest baseball player not in the Hall of Fame Ooh. who doesn't deserve to be in? Uh, examples that he offers are Fred McGriff and Dale Murphy. I think Dale Murphy's uh, right up there. I, w- I, would say, uh, I would say Reggie Smith is probably... The best player who doesn't quite deserve to get in. Nick, what would you say? Well, you know, I'm not even going to answer that question okay. because we have the pre- uh, the prelog of people like Pete Rose, who I'm assuming he's saying doesn't deserve to be in because he bet on baseball, blah, blah, blah. But like until Pete Rose is in the Hall of no, Fame. Nobody's saying who's the best that actually does not deserve to be in, you see. Like who is on the line, but you, you wouldn't cross the line. The Steve Garvey, uh, Kirk Gibson line of like uh, really good players, but not quite Hall of Fame. Uh, yeah. I'm going to see how long they'll go with this. Yeah. Gonna, uh, well, we're going to have an opportunity to dance here in a second. Yeah. You know what? I would say uh, Bobby Gritch. Ooh. That, that's, that's hurtful. No, because I loved him as an These Oreo. are made up names. <laughs> yeah. These are, I grew all. up in a baseball household and I never heard any Speaking of these names. Speaking of Bobby yeah. Gritch, was that's, the highest, a, that's a Sesame Street character. Yeah. He, was the now, you, he had a mustache that could have easily been. That's he a was, Muppet. He was one of the great. Is Lou Whitaker in the home? Oh, uh, he's on the, he's on the, uh, <laughs> he's on the bubble. Uh, he's like on the veterans committee. Yeah. Re- think, and he's probably the likeliest to go in. Yeah. Um, um, I would. Gritch is a little bit ahead of him, but I think they both deserve to get in. Okay, uh, Nick, uh, you're in my uh, turn to dance. Uh, Though voting is for suckers, what fictional character would be so awesome as president of the United States? Uh, Bean from Ender's Game. Wow. Wow. uh, Wait, you know, think about it, Peter. Think about it for a second. No, he didn't. So he's probably a better, in some ways, he's a better chief of staff, but you actually, but like, it's it's time uh, for somebody who's not maybe the greatest leader, but just effective at figuring out how to get stuff done. And Elizabeth uh, Warren. um, No, not Elizabeth (laughs) Warren. He's not the guy with with all, right? He, in fact, creates, he he works outside of the system to create uh, create plans that enable individuals to accomplish their goals. He invented the little string mechanism, which nobody had ever thought of before, that allowed them to turn in the battle room. Thanks, Nick. It was a victory for individual liberty in battle school. Uh, I mean, I would vote for being 2020. I'm not going to lie. Um, but I mostly just want to thank the question asker for prefacing it with voting is for suckers because it yeah. is. 
Uh, obviously, the answer to the question is Valentine Michael Smith. Uh, Tex. I honestly thought you were oh. going to say Valentine from the Enders Shouldn't Game series. Shouldn't it be Jubal, also, uh, or what's his name, uh, Jubal Jones? I just or want what? all the sexing to happen. Okay. <laughs> just the that He would bring back the White House swimming pool, for yeah. sure, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tex, who says, P.S. Catherine Mangy Ward is my favorite living libertarian. Why are we even... A- why are we even... Asking this question, yeah. Uh, someone, the fire the moderator, says, "Yo, libertarians, please comment so that you have to." Be is the it one. how? Is it how he's defining living? I, I, I feel the need to check on yeah, that. Yeah, this ain't mm-hmm. living. Yeah. <laughs> uh, please comment on New Zealand's transition away from mm-hmm. socialism in the 1980s, which we talked about in the issue with the three Ds and the Catherine's terrible hands. Uh, why wasn't Roger Nomics more of a slam dunk mm-hmm. for free market thinking? Objectively, Tex Kubaki, Catherine. Uh. Everything about that question was amazing, including the, uh, I assume, like objectivist right. sign off yeah. there, A+. plus. Um, so we, yeah, Matt weirdly alluded to the fact that we did a piece many, many years ago that were, that was a, a trio of actual successes in cutting government. So not just reducing the rate of growth, not just deregulating, not just, this, but actually cutting the size and scope of government. And New Zealand was one of those examples. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I'm, my New Zealand history might not be super a plus here it's been a while since i read that piece but one thing that i remember about it it is nine years old uh, one thing i remember about it is that it um it was done by essentially a a liberal government and i think that's Mm -hmm. one one really interesting um factoid because the same is true of when canada managed to substantially cut the size and scope of their um of their government um the other third example was post-world war ii United, United States, States. Mm-hmm. Harry Truman. Um, so uh, I, I think there is something in this space of, if not bipartisan, then transpartisan, cross partisan reform, mm. cross partisan reform. Something where you can get people who would be naturally opposed to this thing on board with this thing. Well, this is like a Nixon going to China. Yeah. And hopefully being interned in a Uyghur concentration but I have, camp. Yeah. I have yeah. no idea why it hasn't caught on more. It seems like other world leaders would look at that thing and be like yeah. oh my god they solved one of my biggest problems i want to do it too and and it was generally speaking if i'm remembering correctly uh it was also that the governments that cut spending actually were rewarded at the ballot box yeah, the most they were, it wasn't they, like they were out and done. It, it was yeah. not it, it was not like what we have seen oh. with some kind of european austerity which right. r- results Is fake in austerity, uh, backslash yeah. backslash yeah. backlash yeah. And also a state costume. New Zealand has not become the model that we might hope right. it would have become. However, if you look at uh, some of the Nordic countries that Bernie Sanders claims to yeah. love, all the kind of quasi-socialist countries, they have actually enacted a bunch of um, light, moderate, insufficient, but meaningful uh, market-based Market reforms, reforms yeah. over the last 10 or 20 years. Like reforms. Eh, they've got, yeah. they've yeah. gone, yeah. Yeah. they have Super gone in a better direction in, a, in, uh, in terms of taxes, in terms of their welfare states, in terms of price controls, in particular price controls have, uh, have really fallen by the wayside in, in those countries in ways that have been, uh, per- basically productive. Uh, yeah. Oh, I was just going to point out that that uh, that suite of stories was in an issue that you mentioned that was printed in 3D. Yeah. And yes. we we actually that was a companion to a bunch of 3D videos featuring that Reason TV ran featuring Mike Gravel. Mike Gravel. <laughs> uh, and they're still online. And we yeah. sent out the issue with 3D, 3D glasses, glasses yeah. and everything. And that's just one more way in which I, I'm like freaking proud as hell to be part of an organization that does stuff like that i mean we not only do we start a video platform before it's you know before it's uh common uh we printed a uh, personalized cover issue where forty five thousand subscribers got a personalized issue uh with in 2004 with circle. their house and and information that was key to their congressional district and zip code a 3d issue it's just it's a lot of fun to kind of play around with the new technology that we tend to believe is going to make our lives better. The we know where you live issue, as I've said before, is the issue that made me notice reason for the first time. There you go. Um, Maxime asks, name a public figure or reason staffer. It's obviously reason staffer yeah. whose intellectual stature and appearance would be most enhanced by donning a John Bolton style mustache. Ooh. I think there's only one answer to this question. And he's sitting at this table. Nick Gillespie with a with a Bolton stash. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've just seen, the walrus gray. 
when when the like two the gray of y'all gets black. when the two of y'all were in your final throws of the Declaration of Independence, <laughs> mm. y'all grew book beards. We did, yeah, yeah. And it was independently a, of each other. It was yeah. a thing. It was a situation, y'all. And I, I don't think a, we need to repeat that. I had a, no. I'm, I'm what do you I'm have against much beards? Sure. I'm pro. I'm pro your beard. The yeah, ginger Hitler yeah, no. <laughs> situation I had, uh, that happened over here. I had for a while and, uh, like terrorists. And the, yeah. I, you know, there are uh, some good beards, but these two were bad I, beards, uh, and I don't want to see it again. The end of that, too, was that I ended up shaving it down to like a handlebar mustache, and I That's was on good. a bunch of TV shows <laughs> in rapid succession, including two things with Judge Napolitano. And at one point, I showed up wearing like a handlebar mustache, and he was like, he didn't want to acknowledge it sure. or anything. And then I had shaved it off. And afterwards, he was like, when I saw him like a day later, and he was like, Nikki, I got to tell you that, uh, <laughs> like, I didn't know what was going on. Um, and, can we yeah. also just pause and very, very briefly relive the the one episode of the Judge Napolitano show that we three were all on? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nick and Matt and I were on um, a, it was like a Christmas or Thanksgiving episode. Right. And it was re aired quite regularly for a while afterward. I was pregnant. And they decided to compensate for that by giving me the biggest hair right. of all time. Matt had his unibrow uh, plucked against his will by the makeup artist. Oh, yeah. Uh, and Nick had a particularly Brandy. shiny kind of Lego hair helmet oh, going yeah. on. Yeah. And it was like, it just, it was like one of the more right. bizarre experiences. Like they put me in the leg chair and then they looked at me and moved yeah. me out of the leg chair. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. was my real, that was like one of my proudest TV moments. And there was also just a whole digression about fountain pens in that episode of the show. But it was cool because we got to do like libertarian basics and they right. reared it a bunch of times. So actually it was great. The judge I miss Freedom is, Watch. Yeah, it's a great show. Uh and the judge is serious about his pens. Absolutely yeah. dead, a hundred percent serious about his pens. And that's another thing that your dollars help us do is to go the By hell Josh on, Napolitano fountain pens. To, to go on television, to go oh, on our friend oh. uh Kennedy's show. Right. We mm -hmm. uh, had we co started a show with her, uh, uh Camille Foster and I back in the day and that the successor still lives and it has all of us on all the time uh, pretty much and uh and it's great to go out there and uh represent you disappoint you whatever uh, uh titillate you uh with uh, going where people are looking about politics um let's go to some lightning round stuff suderman brian ruff needs to know what's the best american whiskey for about 30 dollars uh, Russell's Reserve 10 or Elijah Craig small batch. Uh, Russell's Reserve is uh, basically fancy wild turkey and it's delicious. It is the best sip of whiskey straight that you can get in the $30 price range. Um, but uh, if you're is making $30 old fashions, a lot. Uh, $30 is the right amount to get something that's really good, but not exceptionally okay. pricey. Um, and if you, but if you're making old fashions, uh, Elijah Craig for sure. Uh, Follow up Sola, aka Lasso Lazen via Twitter. Uh, Suderman, best liquor for eggnog? Uh, the easiest one is whiskey. The better one is rum. The best one is to actually make a home uh, a home liquor blend out of rum, cognac, and rye. Um, and you got to play with it a little bit, uh, but uh, you you can't screw up whiskey. Rum is a little bit complicated, so you, so there's some mistakes you can make there. But I, I encourage mm. people to play with blends. Uh, final uh, uh, related question for you, and I don't know who said it, but I remember it. Um, uh, you like good uh, whiskey and stuff, so why do you like Jameson? What's wrong with you? Uh, because Jameson is consistent and not terrible, and 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 a big thing. Uh, like if you're looking for like if you go to if I go to. You know, great cocktail bars uh, all over the country. Um, I always try to sort of like research cocktail bars whenever I'm in a new city. But often you're at a like research. Well, right. I, I, I look at the guides. I look at what's won the awards, um, uh, and and then I and then I pick places to go because that's a yeah. thing that I like. But at the same time, I also like dive bars. And when you are at a dive bar, you don't want to get a a mixed drink, what you want is to get something that is going to be consistent and tolerable. And that means beer or it means a pretty good inexpensive whiskey. And Jameson is a pretty good inexpensive whiskey. A bartender pouring Jameson over ice can't mess it up. Uh, Catherine Eric asks, do you routinely routinely rotate your hair dye color uh, mm. and do your kids dye their hair too? It's a little personal there. Eric. Uh, what's harder Finding time to write your own pieces or trying to get your writers to turn in timely pieces. That's a that's a rude <laughs> question. Wow. Eric, that's rude. Wow. I, yeah. I almost feel like did I write that question in yeah. some kind of like ambient blackout? Did you? Um I I I was rotating my hair colors. I am now I'm now trying this like semi human hair situation. Uh, my children, as is the tradition of children. Is that every... your Dungeons and Dragons character class is semi human? Semi hmm. yeah. 
true um i uh no i told you man i got i've got on tiktok and now all i want to do is watch D D shit on tiktok because it's great like just a recommendation anyway um my children do not want to dye their hair because in the time honored tradition of children everywhere if their parents do it it's not cool so mm. it's not cool they're like yeah super lame not interested um the hardest thing is to get other people to turn things on time uh mark asked a question that i'll direct at nick since he's written about this a lot over the years it is about our huge national debt uh and why or whether it uh matters uh mark has a friend who says i hear you and lots of other people warning about how the mm -hmm. national debt is reaching record levels and if we don't do anything to stop it all sorts of terrible things will happen okay i'm ready to believe that but y'all been saying that forever mm. um so uh, people have been sounding the, the same alarm for 40 years and so far none of the dire consequences have happened. Why should I believe it now? What do you say to those people who are making those types of arguments? Yeah, things that can't go on forever don't go on forever. And a government that is spending, you know, a trillion dollars more than it takes in a year is uh, it's going to run out of money at some point. It's going to run out of credit or it's going to have other effects. I think the biggest um, uh, thing to think about, too, is that the theory that I believe is that um, having excess debt, um, you know, a large persistent national debt that shows no signs of slowing down but only increasing has a negative impact on uh, economic growth, on long-term economic growth. And this is something that both left-wing economists at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, as well as uh, more traditional and conventional uh, free market economists agree on. Um, and it helps explain why in the 21st century we've seen persistent economic growth rates in the 1% to 2% range rather than in the 3 to 4% range, which was something that was common at a point when debt levels were lower. Um, I do, I, if I may, yeah, he does raise a good question of, you know, we should be living in an era based on general kind of macroeconomic theory, you know, that everybody accepts we should have high inflation, we should have, you know, all sorts of economic issues that are not happening. And there is, a, I think, a strong case to be made that we have outlived the ability of most of our economic theory, macroeconomic theories to explain why what is happening is happening. So we can take this all with a grain of salt. My opposition to debt is all of those things, plus the fact that debt becomes a spending category on its own because you have to pay interest on that debt, even with the low interest rates that right. we're seeing now. And so uh, interest on the debt is one of the biggest uh, growing categories of federal spending. So all yeah. we're doing is spending money to carry a huge debt load. And it's a real problem. And that and it's already, I think, the third or fourth largest yep. single budget item, and it'll get bigger over time. And you know, it either uh, you, you either inflate the money to pay it off or you reduce services or you raise taxes. And that that's one of the reasons why it, it, people believe it uh, reduces economic growth. You know, down the road, there's going to be a reckoning The you know, the dawn always comes, the bar always closes and the tab has to. And be when you paid. have a crisis, uh, an economic crisis, yeah. it becomes much harder to respond if you don't have the leeway to spend a little more to kind of manage yeah. your budget at that time, which you don't have when you have extremely it's, high debt. You know, uh, and I'm sorry because this is a landing sure. round, but it's hilarious that you hear again and again among you no know, Democratic candidates saying, you know, oh, you know, we're in a terrible world where most Americans don't have $400 to spend in an emergency. Which is a complete <laughs> misreading of right. the actual underlying but, statistics. But it's like, so we have 23, 24 billion or trillion dollars in debt but they're not worried about that. Yep. You know, it's like. Yeah. Also, if you want a fictional exploration of the this question mm -hmm. and what it might look like if it all goes to hell in the near term, I recommend Lionel Shriver's The Mandibles. Uh, let us go to a question that I'll direct uh, for Catherine from uh, Larry. How would you characterize, and I'm doing this because I don't understand what he's talking about. Okay. Uh, how would you characterize the intersection of the libertarian and rationalist communities, mm. e.g. Slate Star Codex, less wrong. And what's your outlook on them? Do any of you frequent rationalist or effective altruism sources? Mm. I love me some Slate Star Codex. I am a regular reader. Uh, my colleague, our colleague, Mike Riggs and I sometimes have like a little Slate Star Codex book group when he's in town where we just talk about the latest post. Um, I, I uh, you know, came out of the objectivist universe uh and if you're making a venn diagram of libertarians and objectivists and rationalists and atheists and the kind of whole cluster there uh there's a heck of a lot of overlap 
Um, in general, I try to avoid the vegan phenomenon of, you know, when you walk into the room and then you say, like, I do CrossFit and I'm a vegan and I'm an atheist, right? Like these sort of things that people feel compelled to announce. Uh, I would say that the people who describe themselves as rationalists sometimes fall into that trap a little bit, mm. uh, whereas libertarians are a little more likely to, like, slow burn the libertarianism in there um, a little more likely um, and thereby perhaps be more likely to change minds. Uh, question that I'll answer from QB. Hi, in the spirit of Dave Smith, I have something to ask about priorities. Why do you seem to be more outraged at people having discussions with Richard Spencer than CIA officials? The CIA is responsible for killing millions of people, led the U.S. into war on multiple occasions, blah, blah, blah. What has Richard Spencer done that comes close to that barbarism? He continues reason or beltway libertarians, whatever you want to be called. We don't want to be called beltway libertarians, QB. Uh, seem to be more concerned with and more viscerally outraged at people having stupid opinions on skin pigmentation than with people promoting dropping bombs on children. Why? What are you talking about? <laughs> so, uh, no, like, what are you talking about? Yeah, Q, we're pretty, QB. What are you talking about? We're pretty outraged about the bombing of children and stuff. Um, like, the, think, when's the last time yeah. anyone here even thought of a Richard Spencer who wasn't like a? I was just well, actually there's because a new there. Yeah, we have a, a new whole, reason to think about Richard Spencer. We have here. the other Richard Spencer who's been in the news, but um, no, I mean, I think I think it's a fair question to say what are your coverage priorities but i i think that there is both um in feedback to journalists and also on twitter there's sometimes this sort of if you are taking a minute to focus on or look at one thing there will always be someone who will chime in and be like what about the other more important thing and you can't always just do the one most important thing all of the time that would be really boring and unfun to read and no one would consume it so I know that's not a satisfying answer to the people who want us to always be covering their thing, but um, we we do cover those other things on the list. Can I be more focused on the actual question? Yeah. It's like, yeah, you know, race in America and the idea of fixed ethnic identity is a big problem in American history. It's one of the original problems with American history and American society. It continues to be a problem. And if you're a libertarian, if you're an individualist, if you're a rationalist, I would I would suspect, you know, people like Richard Spencer are pathetic and they are anti-libertarian. I mean, in, in Panic Attack, Robbie Suave's book, he interviews Richard Spencer. So he, he talks to Richard yeah. Spencer and Richard Spencer says, I hate libertarians. I'm the anti-libertarian. That's one of the reasons. And people who are obsessed with spig, uh, uh, skin pigmentation, you know, and then they're like, well, what about inflation or what about dropping bombs? It's like, that's your problem. It's not our problem. We're being consistent when we push back against dumb ideas that screw up individuals and keep them from being able to participate in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's a, 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 a I think a, people a, a, tend to project uh, what they feel defensive about as being our priorities. Like, you know, why are you so obsessed with people having with stupid drugs. opinions on skin pigmentation? It's like- that's not, as a percentage of our coverage, not that high. No, I don't know. Um, and and as Nick rightly points out, um, you know the I think the greatest uh, sentence against, and I won't be able to quote it because I'm bad uh, about uh, how stupid racism is comes from Ayn Rand. I mean, it's like it's uh, it is uh, it is like the dumbest form of collectivism possible. Um, so that's a that's a paraphrase. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong, mm. but that's, um, that's pretty. Loose paraphrase. We have been running now for going on like 70 minutes. Uh, should we keep on going, man? Keep on keep going. On. Um, <laughs> uh, Marathon. Yeah. Let's, let's. We're just getting started. Get, uh, Ooh, yeah. let's, let's the, get, we can do a couple more. A couple of more here. Okay. Uh, thank you for listening. This is the, the end of second act break. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just a, a way of. Uh, 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 Nick, what is the most libertarian music genre? Stephen wants to know. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the easy answer is to say punk, but uh, I'm going to go with progressive rock. Yeah. No, th I think that's the 
actually the correct answer yeah. is that prog rock is I, the most you know, I'm libertarian. Talking, yeah. but gotcha. <laughs> did, yeah. did Dave, but did not, Dave Weigel get to you no, here? Is this I'd a, like to think that he... he no, uh, you got to him? Uh, but what I was going to say, what I like about progressive rock is that it is the... I, what, one of the things I love about rock music in particular, and I think rock is a genre, that era is over. Uh, it's more of a historical thing than an aesthetic thing or anything, but progressive rock you have people who have a little bit of knowledge of stuff and then they just make put together the dumbest things in the world because they don't know better or they don't care and they create their own tradition they create their i mean listening to stuff like elp or yes or genesis it's on some level it's profoundly stupid and i don't say that as a criticism it's just it's so dumb and cobbled together and it's like oh you know what this sounds good or i, I learned this when i was taking uh, keyboard lessons and and it just becomes this great self-made kind of f f medium and there's uh, a diy wonderful. baroqueness yeah. to it yeah, that yeah. is really delightful yeah and and punk is a is also diy stripped down so it's but it's the thing that's great about popular music and about rock music and whatnot i think in general and it's true of all other types of art forms is that it's diy and it's kind of fascinating when you think about the intersection of um you know, a free time uh, because after World War II, kids didn't have to work and they had a lot of downtime, cheap musical instruments, the intense boredom visited upon them by public school and, and private school for that matter, and kind of freedom from uh, dealing with their parents and a desire to do something new. Like that's all just wonderful. And it gets mashed together into, uh, you know, just great, ridiculous, overblown you know, uh, left overture by Kansas or whatever, oh, yeah. or, you know, a, a quadruple or 10 album set by ELP, you know, it's just great. Uh, With I am just going to invent an answer, which, uh, it has a lot of the same characteristics as Nick's, but the, the surf music board, board yeah. suburban yeah, kids yeah, yeah, in yeah. the late fifties and early sixties playing garage rock in their garages. Oh, and, and there's no totally question awesome. that Dick Dale, uh, not his real name, the yeah. king of the surf guitar who started out in Boston uh, in the Boston area and ended up in Southern California, uh, is like, read his Wikipedia entry. And you're like, this guy is a libertarian. It's a hero. great Armenian American, uh, um, Lebanese, I think, uh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. uh, Lebanese Armenian though. Right. It's kind of cool. Uh, William asked, and this is obviously for, for Peter, why is the idea of living forever, i.e. after we die, we go on to existence in heaven or hell, unidirectional? Uh, doesn't forever imply that a thing always was and always will be in a forward and backwards direction in relation to time. Matt. And then he says technically two questions. Sorry. Okay. So so uh, the question is, the question there is basically, <laughs> what about Dr. Manhattan yeah. from... <laughs> From Watchmen, because well, Doctor Manhattan for Peter. Right. transcends right. Trust humanity. Process. He he goes into the 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 transfixer machine. I forget what it's called, mm -hmm. um, and has his atom scrambled, and and then he becomes a creature beyond time. Uh, and in, and you know what? Like I guess I'm gonna kind of reject the like the original question there about like wait is is infinity from now until forever or is it both ways until forever? If you reach that state, does it matter? Wow. What kind of doctor was Dr. Manhattan? Definitely, was he like a dentist? Definitely a PhD. You Not think so? Or, yeah, he was, he was some sort of physicist, oh, I okay. believe. Yeah. Um, maybe. Uh, sort of Jeff asked a question that might uh, be a good starting to wrap up type of thing. He asked a series of questions. So I'm just going to do one and direct it at Jeff. Is it J or G E O? It's just the standard Jeff. J, okay, J E F F. If, 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 it's G, if it's Jeff, yeah, then we. Let's go to the next question. The There's a lot of aesthetics to dames that we need to really get into in the second 90 minutes. Of yes. This. Okay, Nick. Yeah. Uh, ooh. Ooh. Shots uh, fired. Is, <laughs> Nick, is, Nick is a great American name. Uh, mm. it is, uh, Seems a little Greek, to be quite honest. Yeah, kind of. You know. Uh, is reason having, Catherine, a lasting effect persuading non-libertarians to accept more libertarian positions? Please give some specific examples. Criminal justice reform, what appears to be imminent marijuana legalization or encouraging developments. However, the renewed popularity of socialism as an idea dramatic increases in federal spending and regulation in the 21st century uh, multiple ongoing foreign interventions and a crackdown on immigration are very discouraging is reason making a difference overall Catherine mega ward god i hope so otherwise a lot of us have just wasted a lot of time here um, i find it interesting that that questioner didn't ask about uh, uh skin pigmentation yeah. yeah yeah i mean where are their priorities um no i th i think i think the answer is yes i think the answer is yes uh for many of the 
positive uh, reasons that were just listed there. Uh, also, just going to use the specific example of like, um, you know, people who I have seen over time exposed to libertarian ideas, you know, my family, my close friends who have gone from uh, sort of general incomprehension of libertarianism or a vague sense that probably were just actually conservatives mm. um, to a broader awareness of libertarianism as its own thing. So while awareness raising is always an annoying answer to questions like this, I think the idea of a political philosophy that is centered around free minds and free markets and, and individual liberties and, uh, and human rights is, um, is an idea that has like penetrated the general culture a bit more. People don't seem as uh, uncomprehending of this thing as they were when I was a wee young mm. thing in the libertarian movement. Um, so that alone is a plus. Um, and also, you know, I think uh, to give a little shout out to the Reason Foundation, yes. the nonprofit that publishes Reason Magazine and mm. who will actually be the beneficiary of your donations should you choose to donate. Um, they do a whole bunch of work on the local and state level that um, is really hard, long haul stuff, but that um, really is can be a pretty substantial um, benefit to actual human beings. And this is, you know, from many years ago, like privatization of waste collection. I mean, not mm. necessarily glamorous stuff. If you've ever driven on a toll road, I think Reason can take some credit for that. Um, and uh, if you've ever been incarcerated in a private prison. Yeah, you're welcome. Mm. Uh, and, uh, so I think that kind of stuff, you know, pen pension reform is a big thing that we're working on now. School choice. Um, it, you know, there have, there have been real strides in those areas and that's not because of liberals and it's not because of conservatives. Mm -hmm. It really is because of people who are doing the libertarian thing. Do you feel that way, Matt? You're nearing the end of your life. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, is, it, is it a I mean, life well spent? One of the uh, areas in which I think uh, our, our work uh, helped kind of seed a broader understanding is particularly in criminal justice reform. I mean, mm. seven years ago uh, counts on one hand the number of media organizations that was talking uh, about civil asset forfeiture. Right. It's like Jacob Solom was and nobody else. And Radley Balco, too, um, who, you know, uh, uh, got his journalistic chops at reason. Um, it was us. And we were framing a lot of policing issues uh, in terms of the criminalization of police, in terms of no knock raids that were happening elsewhere, uh, the, the bail systems that just sort of like trap people into a, a cycle of squeezing down poor people. Um, these are things that we wrote about consistently all the time and obviously drug war mm -hmm. but like very specific uh you know uh uh the forensics uh fraud everywhere around us the, the kind of phony science that goes with it the the way that prosecutors and cops too often have real ironclad immunity and they can tell lies and not be uh, uh not be punished for it and when uh, the ferguson Missouri happened in 2014 mm -hmm. or sort of a nationwide um uh sense of awareness about um the criminalization of uh, 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 or the militarization of police, I, sh I should say, um, that conversation was a conversation that used our vocabulary and we helped specifically produce that understanding, I think. And what um, you're saying is like dot, 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 Kim Kardashian. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the, the some I'll of take the credit for that. Some of the people who uh, helped uh, push through criminal justice reform uh, in not criminal, big reform, but a little bit. The first step act uh, with the Trump White House are like diehard libertarian reason fans um, uh, who have worked with Kim Kardashian to help make this happen. Um, I will. I feel very good about that and, and think that that I think that the world I mean, you were talking about in a recent podcast, yeah. Nick. Um, uh, and I think it's an interesting point where like all the Democratic candidates now, except for the 75 year old, you know, uh, corn pops. Um, are in favor of legalizing That's marijuana. At least a few of them. This, well, I wouldn't put Bernie as a corn pop. Uh, well, he supports marijuana legalization yeah. anyway. Uh, anyways, they're all, basically almost the entire field support yeah. this. And it's not well, suddenly that they all got brave. It's right. just that the country moved in this direction about this issue, yeah. just in a momentous I uh, think, style way. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the the as, as I get older and I think about this stuff more and I get more and more kind of uh, you know, uh, distant from partisan politics and whatnot. 
I think of libertarian as an adjective, as a direction, as a kind of default setting. And there's no question over the past, the 51 or 52 years of reason has existed, the country has become vastly more libertarian. And, you know, we're more comfortable with the idea of choice in every aspect of our lives and the and letting other people have choices, et cetera. We individualize our sensibility, the way we the way we uh, eat, the way we dress, the way we live, the way we work, the way we you know uh, get married, all of that. And I think reason has played a uh, an essential role in that. And that also said that's one of the reasons why social conservatives don't matter anymore. I mean, there's they still have a voting block and all of that, but they don't matter. Donald Trump, you know, he throws bones to the religious right, but he's you know he's living proof that the religious right doesn't matter anymore. He could not have been. Uh, elected president if they were really powerful anymore. They're chasing after him. Um, and it also Smash cut to 10 years from now when na nationalism is like fully back. Yeah, well, well, this is the, you know, the the real kind of battle lines now. And on, on the right, there is this resurgence of kind of nationalism and a, of a collectivist American identity that says you all have to look like Mike Pence. You have to be male and look like Mike Pence. Otherwise, you're not really American. We might suffer you to live here. But then on the left and on the progressive left, you see this when, you know, people in AOC's posse is kind of like the, uh, you know, they're the Spice Girls of a new kind of weird collectivism where they say, you know, literally, like, if you have, we don't need brown voices, we don't need black voices or gay voices that are not progressive. So, like, if you actually you know, are like Chance the Rapper or Kanye West or something. And you say, you know what, maybe all blacks don't have to vote for Democratic Party or you can be individualistic, et cetera. Like, we don't want you here. That's the real battle line. And that's where I think the libertarian sensibility is most important. And it's also, you know, I look at uh, 50 years of reason. I'm, I'm happy to have been working here, uh, you know, but I'm more happy that it exists and that I was able to read it and have it inform the way I think about individualism and the possibilities of the future. I really thought we were going to make it through a whole podcast without any Spice Girls references, Nick. No, you it did not can't be done. That. Yeah, uh, Suderman, you live in D.C. Uh, do you see a uh, reason <laughs> uh, affecting this this hell bath that surrounds us? Yeah. So, I mean, if, if the question hell is, uh, the what question is, is, wait, wait, can we let's just dilate on this? For a, a hell second. bath, a hell bath, is, a bath of hell. I think yeah. we all know what a hell bath is. Hell's mostly, though, the fire, not the water. For it's a lake of fire, I mean, I guess, so it like, does get kind of confusing. But maybe there's no. some Dantean level in which you're like just it getting prunier and prunier. It's it's sort of in your like, hell bath. He's yeah, googling yeah, hell he's, bath. Yeah. Where yeah. do bad folks go when they die? They go to a hell bath where the angels don't fly. Uh, right. I think yes. Right. Um, Reason magazine people. makes a difference in the lives of millions of people who read our website all the time. Um, it makes a difference in the lives of many, 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 many podcast readers, uh, excuse me, podcast listeners. What's that, was, that, that was Welchy in there. Um, <laughs> podcast listeners uh, who, I mean, it has just been, it has been incredible to see here uh, to uh, how many people uh, listen and, and are affected by it. But I would also say you mentioned Radley Balco, and this is sort of the inside the beltway thing that I think we do that Reason Magazine specifically does really well is that doing good work at Reason Magazine creates opportunities to do good work elsewhere for less obviously receptive audiences. And so one of the things that that Reason uh, writers get to do is write for the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and these, these publications with truly giant national and international re uh, reaches. And we get to do that because because people have donated to Reason Magazine and funded our jobs and allowed us to to spend time doing work here uh, first. And that exists because uh, because Reason exists. And so that is that is something that um, that is very important that uh, that I have personally uh, sort of uh, experienced and, and benefited from. Uh, Catherine Mingy Ward here um, has written several, you know, like Sunday Review cover stories over the last couple mm -hmm. of years for The New York Times. That happens because Reason Magazine exists. And without without sort of the, um, and it's not quite a testing grounds, but in some ways the proving grounds of Reason Magazine, those the, are, those voices don't appear in the New York Times and in the Washington Post and in the Wall Street Journal. Those voices are absent. And that that's a different world than one that I think is not as good a world. I think that's a great place to stop. Thank you, Peter, Nick, Catherine, and especially everyone uh, listening to this this far. And thank you for your questions. I we They got... were good, yo. They were yeah. like, I, like, 
I just want to really say the people who send questions so far exceeded my expectations as to make me have bad feelings about my expectations. So, so what, did you have the soft bigotry of low expectations I going into this whole thing? I 100% did. Really? And it's because sometimes people on the internet are bad, but these yeah. internet people who sent us questions for this podcast today were good. Super good. Uh, and again, uh, uh, great questions. And many of them were really great that we didn't have time to get to. And only a few of them that we didn't have time to get to were not great. You can uh, you can feel free to angrily retweet your questions at us and we will try to answer them in the Twitters. Oh, mm. very good. And we'll be having a, a choice webathon content throughout the course of it, which is running from today, December 3rd, mm -hmm. until... Something like what? December. A future date. A future no, date. It's like for a week, this for seven days, right? Coming out today. You should try that again. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, so just don't, say, don't just Webathon say. Webathon is running yeah. all week. Webathon will be running all week. We'll have a lot of different content, blog posts, and such like here. Go to reason.com slash donate. <laughs> that was hard. You did You did good. Uh, and uh, see about all the giving levels and swag and fun that you can have. Uh, in return for giving us money. And thank you very much uh, for listening and doing that. Goodbye. We, sh we should have a reason.com that's just reason slash backslash. And you no. have to type the word backslash. Nope. We should get our, and it should redirect to the website. Nope. So in answer to your question, yes, Catherine feels like firing Peter right now. Right now. <laughs>